All right, chapter two, biopsychology, neuroscience, and human nature. In this chapter, we are going to be exploring the field of biological psychology or biopsychology as well as neuroscience. So biopsychology is studying the interaction between our biology and our psychology. How are these genes playing out? How are they affecting who we are? Um, and not just genetics, but the chemistry of our body, the um, production of hormones, the production of neurotransmitters, how do you eat even, how is the, your food intake affecting your depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or whatever you're dealing with in life. For instance, if I have somebody who is depressed or anxious, the first thing I ask, well, maybe not the first thing, but one of the first things I ask about is what they're eating because a lot of people are on low fat diets and you need fat and cholesterol in particular, which is considered like an evil chemical, but you need cholesterol in order to produce sex hormones, in order to produce neurotransmitters. And if you are on a low fat diet, you may not be able to produce the chemicals that make you feel happy. So I suggest anybody who's dealing with depression or anxiety increases their fat intake, uh, maybe even going onto a ketogenic diet, which is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. One of the things that gets talked about a lot in psychology, as well as the sciences, is evolution. So evolution, I mean, everybody knows what this is, but it's the process of how a organism adapts to its environment and how it changes, uh, particularly over time. Now there is controversy from day one when evolution, the term evolution was coined by Darwin. Um, there, there's been controversy about whether evolution is real or not. Um, all scientists agree that there is, well, there's macro evolution and micro evolution. Ma macro evolution are these big, huge changes like from an amoeba to a monkey to a human sort of thing. Uh, micro evolution is just small changes. For instance, an animal may start growing thicker fur as after it spent a century living in uh, a more northern client, cli climate, or a, um, uh, a animal may develop more spots on its coat in order to hide better after it moves into a jungle environment. These little changes, these little evolutions, that's a fact. Like that's every scientist on the planet will agree that that happens. All you have to do is like breed dogs or something, and you will see that there are these little tiny evolutions that take place. It is the macro evolution that is so controversial. Um, and there's a lot of valid research on both sides, so I'm not gonna force you to you know, believe anything. Um, but one of the issues is that in the history of psychology, we sort of latched on to evolution and said, this is the truth and therefore psychology will be based on this theory, which the definition of a theory is something that is supported by research but is not proven. So it's not a law, it's not a fact. Um, and so it has caused some issues in understanding the psychological processes. It's caused some issues in doing research. Um, we're gonna get into this more in later chapters, but I just want to point that out. So, um, I think you guys basically get, I'm just looking at my notes, like you guys get the ideas of evolution, I assume. Like if you were not taught the premises of evolution, let me know like in a discussion board or something because I'd be curious. But you know, things like natural selection, survival of the fittest. Um, the idea is that there are certain adaptations that didn't work very well. For instance, we live in the high desert. I am a pale Irish girl. My skin is not adaptive for the heat like you can see like all my sunburn because i was out in the sun today cleaning my pool um so that i can escape the heat but like white skin is not adapted for heat it's not adapted for intense sunshine and dark skin is not adapted for lack of sunshine so um, for instance i lived in ireland for three years which was pretty cool and weirdly enough a lot of nigerians have immigrated to africa so one of the things that the, um, the Irish health field has recognized is that there's a lot of vitamin D deficiency in these Nigerians living in Ireland because their skin is very dark and they're not able to absorb the little amount of sunshine that Ireland gets and they are not producing vitamin D. 
Light skin, on the other hand, in this intense sun, you are much more likely to get skin cancer and die. And these blue eyes are much more likely to go blind with glaucoma because, or cataracts because of the intense sunscreen. So um, over time, if people, if no more people moved into this area, you would expect to see white people die off and darker skin, brown or black people, um, well, brown people, like there's a thing called brown people, but like Mexicans, Middle Easterners, things like that, would be the, eventually be the prevailing race in according to evolutionary theory. So um, if any of that seems surprising to you, besides your teacher talking about race, which is like not PC nowadays, just FYI, I have an issue with being politically correct. Um, but yeah, so that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> if you don't like it, then you're probably not going to like this class. Okay. So how does this apply to psychology? If we understand evolution, if we understand natural selection, even if you're just looking at like the micro evolution, these small changes, you know, you don't have to believe that we evolved from, you know, amoebas. Um, but you do have to believe that there are adaptations. This helps us to understand our biological self as well as our psychological self. Because you can look at societal evolution where people evolve to adapt to their circumstances. So for instance, um, with recent elections, you had Obama, you have Trump. So how did you mentally e evolve or adapt in order to handle, you know, if, if you didn't like the person who was elected, how did you mentally handle that? Um, and one of the other things that happened is there was a lot of aggressiveness uh, with both presidents. You know, when Obama was president, I had a friend who was, um, her kid was beat up at elementary school for saying that he didn't like Obama. So, um, like this, this is the psychological playing field that you have at any certain time and how do you adapt to that. That is a form of evolution. It's not like evolution in the terms that like a biologist may talk about it, but it is a type of evolution. And thinking about psychological evolution in that sense can help you to understand psychological circumstances, can, can help you to understand an individual, for instance, how to adapt to a domestic violence situation, can also help, under, help you to understand a society, like how did the Germans accept Hitler? Uh, how did they evolve or psychologically adapt to that situation? Um, I will point out, by the way, that Darwin never said that we evolved from monkeys. Um, I'm not actually sure where that came from. Um, but just that people and monkeys had a similar common ancestor. I'm not sure how they know that or whatever. Um, you know, another theory that's actually sort of really been taking hold in the past couple of decades is intelligent design theory. Um, it's not the same as creationism, although there is some overlap there, but it's the theory that there must be some intelligence behind the world because of the complexity of DNA and, and stuff like that. And Darwin actually supported that idea. Um, he said that evolution can only happen in very simple steps, and it can't be a whole bunch of stuff happening at one time, unless it's a random mutation, which is normally not adaptive. It's normally really bad. Like, um, uh, after Chernobyl, horses were being born with like six legs, which not only killed the baby, but killed the mom, and obviously not adaptive. So anyhow, he said that there had to be small, simple changes, and if there's too much complexity, it disproved his theory. So intelligent design is kind of that opposite side saying there is that much complexity. For instance, if you took one cell and you took out the DNA and unraveled it, it would actually be six feet long of, of information. That's how long DNA is, and then it's just, you know, raveled up into the cell. So it's kind of interesting. All right, so genetics. Um, some of this might be simple for you, hopefully, if you've taken biology get some coffee before I go into this. So um, genes are basically a, a code, they contain a code, your DNA, that has all of the, the coding for your, um, your traits, your personality, your looks, and so on. So all of these inherited traits. Now there is also something called the epigenetics, which is a newish um, like in the past decade, it's a new thing that has been discovered where we used to think DNA was destiny. This is, this is what your genetics were. 
this is all there is to it. But now we know that there are epigenetics or there is a DNA code on top of your genes that's controlling the expression of the genes. So you may have a gene for cancer, but it does not necessarily get expressed. Um, and one of the interesting things that controls epigenetics is how you eat and how you live your life. Are you stressed out? Do you smoke? Do you eat your vegetables and so on? Um, okay, so we know, of course, individuals receive half of their genes from each parent. So you get 50% from dad, 50% from mom. Now that is simplistic. That's not exactly true. It's on average 50%. You may actually inherit a little bit more from mom or a little bit more from dad. And that's just sort of the lottery. You may also inherit more from like a previous generation. So um, you get obviously more like say from mom, but then you get a lot of grandfather's characteristics. And so you, um, you may not seem a lot like either of your parents because of that. That is your genotype. You also have something called a phenotype. So genotype is what your genetic code says. For instance, I, I've done 23andMe and I found that I have the genes for red hair, which is cool. I'm Irish, so that's not really surprising. Now, I do not have red hair. It's a little bit red towards the bottom, but that's a dye. So I am definitely a brunette, but I have the DNA for red hair. Now that is a genotype. It is not necessarily what got expressed. Um, my phenotype is brown hair. My genotype says I have the possibility of brown hair or red hair. So what your genetic code says, like the building blocks of your body is your genotype. What actually appears on the outside is the phenotype. Um, phenotype is based on biology, but also is affected by the environment. So, um, we all have like the genetics for wrinkles, for instance, like I'm starting to get old. So I've got a few wrinkles coming in there. I'm 38 now as of making this video. So like we're genetically programmed to age and to get wrinkles. Some people more than others. Um, interestingly, some races do really well with wrinkles um, and some races do bad with wrinkles. Um, however, so that your phenotype though, so how much of those wrinkles get expressed depends on your environment. So if you live in the high desert, you are more likely to have those wrinkles being expressed because of the damage from the sun. If you're stressed out, if you smoke, all of these environmental factors influence the phenotype. So the genotype is not influenced very much by the environment. Maybe a little bit, like if you were by, uh, if you had radiation poisoning, you know, you were in Chernobyl or Fukushima or whatever it's called in Japan, sorry, I can't remember what it's called, then that, that environmental factor may alter your genetics and most likely cause you to get cancer, even if you don't have the gene for cancer. Uh, but most environmental things will not affect genes. However, environments can affect epigenetics, which can affect the expression of your genes. So it's not, they don't, epigenetics doesn't change your DNA, but it turns certain things off and turns certain things on. Um, so let's see some other things about genes. Um, you've got nucleotides, that's the genetic code. AGCT, so adenosine, guanine, cystocene and thymine. Um, and these four chemicals are what composes your DNA. So that's the code that's, you know, the six foot long of DNA. Now you have about 25,000 genes in your body, which is crazy. So chromosomes are the long strips of DNA. When you're conceived, the egg and the sperm both contain 23 chromosomes. And when they come together, those, co those chromosomes fuse together and then you are now born with your 23 chromosomes, assuming everything goes well. In each of the chromosomes, there are sequences of DNA, and that's what a chromosome is. It's a strip of DNA. And the sequences of DNA make up the genes. So you've got chromosomes with lots of genes on them, and each of the genes has alleles, which is our versions of the genes. So I have an allele for red hair. I have an allele for brown hair. I believe I even have an allele for blonde hair. So I've got all sorts of color variation in there. No allele for black hair though. Um, I have an allele for darker skin, which is interesting because I don't have very dark skin. Um, so your genotype has a lot of variability that may not make it out 
to the phenotype. I hope that makes sense. Um, so we often use genetics to try to explain psychological processes. So was somebody born this way? For instance, gender. We have argued for decades about, probably millennia, about are we born a certain way or are we, we raised a certain way? So think about it for yourself. Do you believe that a little boy likes to play with trucks because they are born liking trucks or because they were raised to like trucks because they've watched TV and they've seen kids ads with boys playing with trucks. So is it genetic? Is it nature? Or is it nurture? Is it environment? So we know that genes do explain certain things. Genes explain how happy you are. That's very strongly, strongly correlated with uh, genetics. Genes <coughs> influence our um, personality. Our personality is roughly 50% genetic. So 50%, obviously you're not guaranteed to have a personality like your parents, but there's a good chance you are going to have a similar personality. So how smart you are is genetic. Um, whether you have reading disorders or you're a good reader, religiosity is genetic, um, at partially genetic. All of these things are partially genetic. Some very strongly, some not so strongly. The job you go into is genetic. The hobbies you like are genetic. Um, or at least they're all correlated and associated with genetics. So it's, it's really interesting. I saw a documentary years ago, I wish I could find it again, where they brought these twins together who had never met each other before. And a lot of them had the same jobs. A lot of them were wearing the same outfit. Uh, one of them had married a woman with the same name. They had a poodle. Each of them had a poodle and the poodle was named had the same name and they had never met each other and these guys were like 60 years old. So genetics is a lot more powerful than we give it credit for, um, which you can often see amongst siblings and you can see even more amongst twins because obviously they're sharing all of their genetics. Uh, one of the things to remember about genetics is it's not usually one gene that's controlling something. There's often multiple genes that are all playing a part in something, especially something as complex as, complex as intelligence. If there was one gene for intelligence, then we now have the technology we could go in, we could take that gene out, we could put another gene in, and you could pay for your child's IQ level. Pay for it now rather than paying for it later with schooling. Uh, but intelligence is not one thing. We don't really know what intelligence is. Um, even defining it, we'll talk about this more in the intelligence chapter, to define intelligence is a big, Thing. Like, what does it mean to be smart? So there's not one gene that says, here's your smart gene. It would be nice if that was the case, but it is not. When we talk about genetics and race, we know that um, I'm trying to look at my notes. I think I've already talked about a lot of this stuff. So biologists tell us there are no physical characteristics that divide people into racial groups. We're all one species. That's not exactly true. There's a, there's a meme that goes around on Facebook and it's a, like a lineup of skeletons and it says like black, white, gay, straight, male, female, pirate or something like that at the end. Um, and that's not actually true. Gender, for instance, you can tell by looking at a skeleton whether or not it's a male or female. Um, the... Females usually have wider hips. If you've had a baby, you can tell if a person has had one or more babies based on like there's a notch that is in the pelvic bone because as it widens, it scratches along there. So there's two notches for two or more babies. There's never more than the two. Um, with race, we do know that there are some physical changes. They're not huge, but there are some physical changes. White people tend to have bigger heads. Black people tend to have slightly smaller heads, um, which we'll talk about in the intelligence chapter was used in the past to discriminate against black people. Cause if your brain is smaller, you must be dumber, which is not actually the case. It has nothing, very little to do with it. Um, Physically, I mean, obviously there's the skin color. Some races are more prone to certain diseases than others. Um, yeah, so there are some differences between the races based on genetics, but they're not, 
they're not big and they're not big enough to affect like how smart you are or how capable you are or anything like that. Um, and race itself is not a very precise biological term. So if you have had your DNA done, then like for instance, mine says that I am 68% Irish slash British. So I don't know if I'm Irish, if I'm English, if I'm Scottish, Welsh, that's all sort of mixed together. Now, if you ask an Irish person if they're the same as an English person, they will say, absolutely not. There's a lot of antagonism between the two races. Um, but genetically, they're not, they're, there's not enough difference to be able to genetically test somebody and say, oh, this person is Irish or this person is Welsh or whatever. Now that may change in the future. We may find more specific genetic markers, but you know, race is, it's hard to tell exactly. And then of course there's other things that complicate it. So I, I'm, I'm also part French, German, and Scandinavian. So you'd say, oh, well, you're, you know, hardly Irish at all. Except if you look at the history of Ireland, they were invaded by the French, the Germans, and the Scandinavians. So does that still make me Irish? Does that not make me Irish? It's, yeah, it's complicated. Okay, anyhow, so that's genetics. Genetics, I personally find genetics fascinating with psychology, you know, to, to try to understand what is already programmed into us when we were born, whether it's something serious like schizophrenia or something um, more like a daily occurrence in our life, like gender or our attraction to certain people. Those are all like fascinating genetic questions to, to in my opinion. Um, there's also other things that we need to understand with our biopsychology, our, our neuroscience. So how does the body communicate internally? Let me get rid of that text message. So, um, your brain is stuck in a box. Your brain has no eyes, it has no fingers, it has no ears, it cannot, it does not sense anything. As a matter of fact, if you cut your skull open, you could poke your own brain and it wouldn't hurt. There was a guy who's very famous in psychology named Phineas Gage. He lived in the um, 1800s, early 1900s, something like that. And he was working on the railroad, and he, you tap like this big piece of metal into a hole, um, with dynamite at the other end, so you tap down the dynamite, and sometimes the tapping the dynamite down into this hole would cause it to explode, and now you have this big piece of metal flying through the air. Well, it flew through the air, and it went right through his forehead and out his head, so he had this big hole. He walked away. He went to the doctors on his own. The doctor didn't believe him until he stuck his own finger in his brain to show him that there really was a hole there, um, so he didn't feel anything. However, dramatically affected his personality. He became a very angry person. His wife left them, him, which was shocking for the 1800s. Um, so anyhow, the, the brain, the brain is just sort of stuck there without any ability to, it's sort of like your hard drive. you you can't communicate directly with your hard drive. You have to communicate through a screen and through a keyboard. So the brain's the same way. It just sits there and you have to send it information through your fingers, through your hearing, through your vision and so on. Um, so how does that communication from your ears to your brain work? Well, that is the neurological system. That's the nervous system. So you have your fingers feel something and then they send electrical impulses through your wiring, through your nerves and neurons to your brain and then your brain says okay so this is the message that i got what does this mean which can be funny because sometimes since your brain is not actually seeing things or hearing things your brain may misinterpret what it's seeing or hearing or feeling or smelling um so you may remember like the social media thing about the gold white versus black blue dress well, the reason why people were not able to tell what color the dress was was because their brain was misinterpreting the signals for some of them. Some of them it interpreted it right, others it wasn't sure. So the theory is that they believe that the brain thinks, for some people, thinks that dress might be in shadow, and so therefore it would be another color, and so it shows you another color. It's, it's, I think it's fascinating. It's really interesting, but that's how we can trick the brain the brain is not actually seeing anything. So the brain is sort of like 
the conductor for your body. The brain is controlling everything, it's organizing things, it's trying to interpret things, and then give you input out on your screen so that you can understand what's going on in the world. So it controls your nervous system, which is all the wiring that communicates. It also controls your endocrine system, which is all of the hormones that help you to do things. So the neuron is like the building block of the nervous system. It is a cell that its job is to communicate. It receives information, it processes information, it transmits information to other cells. Um, you also have nerves, which there's not a lot of difference between a nerve and a neuron. A neuron is in your brain, a nerve is in the rest of your body. That's all the distinction. But for psychology, we almost always just talk about neurons because we're talking about the brain system. Um, so there are different types of neurons. Some neurons sense things, like they feel things. There's neurons that are specialized for pain. Um, there's neurons that are specialized for motion called motor neurons. Um, there's interneurons that their only job is to push the message on something else. So if the message is, I see a bear, then an interneuron doesn't see the bear. It doesn't think about the bear. It doesn't you know, do anything except send the message that there's a bear on to the other neurons that do their work. Um, so if you look at a neuron, at the map of a neuron, you have um, different ends of it. So you have an axon and a dendrite. A dendrite receives the message. It collects messages from other cells um, and then it sends it down the rest of the body. So there, there is an interesting thing called an action potential, which is basically it's just the cell firing. And there's a whole physiological aspect of this that we are not going to get into in this class. You know, there's potassium and calcium, and there's these gates that change the, um, like the electrical charge in the axon um, in order to, to cause this. But basically what you need to know is that when a message hits the dendrite, then it causes an action potential or an electrical signal to fire down the neuron. It gets down to the other end of the neuron, um, the axon end, and that end is responsible for now sending the message on to the next one. Now there is a gap between the neurons, and this is called the synaptic gap. Freud actually discovered the synaptic gap. And this electrical charge has to jump the synaptic gap. So you've got two ends, an axon and a dendrite, the receiving end of the next one. They are not touching. It would be a lot easier if they were just like, you know, connected, but there's a little microscopic gap in the middle of them. One end um, has what's called a terminal bulb or bouton, like button, that's another term for it. And inside of that are all of these little messenger chemicals called neurotransmitters. And so they will sort of like this bubble, or it's called a vesicle, will pop out the side of it and it will float through the gap to a, well, the bubble releases neurotransmitters. So they will float through the gap to a receptor on the other side. So sort of like a lock and a key. So they fit into the receptor, then they stimulate an electrical charge or an action potential to go down the next neuron. Kind of confusing, but hopefully you get like the simplistic version of it. And it is, it's really elegant and simplistic in how it works. So the more neurotransmitters, the more firing is gonna happen to the next neurotrans or the next neuron, the stronger the signal will be. Um, the now the neurotransmitters are still bouncing around in that synaptic gap. So there is a process of um, it sometimes it breaks down, sometimes it's taken back and recycled in the original neuron and that's called reuptake. Um, there are things like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that's an antidepressant. So it blocks reuptake from happening so that those serotonin neurotransmitters keep bouncing around and keep activating the next cell, um, stronger signal and serotonin's job is to make you happy. Uh, let's see, what else do you need to know? Um, okay, there's something called brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. The brain has the ability to adapt or, or modify itself to the situation. This is kind of like that microevolution. So these small adaptations, small changes. Um, we used to believe that after 20 years old, the brain never changed again. 
your brain is how it is and that's all there is to it. But we now know that your brain continues to change through your entire lifetime. It does slow down. Um, it slows down after two years old and then after 20, it slows down a lot more. So the older you get, the harder it is to change your ways because neuroplasticity slows down, becomes a little bit harder. So basically what this is, is your neurons ability to connect. So um, there's a saying neurons that fire together, wire together. So if let's say um, you're playing video games. So you have one neuron for video games and another, or uh, eyesight, right? Cause you're looking at the screen and then another neuron for um, hand movement. Uh, so your ability to see what you're doing and control your hands, those two neurons are firing. And because they're both firing, your brain has a process, actually has like these little creepy crawlies in your brain called astrocytes and they'll pull the neurons together so that they, they're now, they're not bound together, but they're, they kind of look like it if you look under a microscope. They, they have lots of arms that will sort of like twist together, but the ends are not actually touching, right? There's the gap, the synaptic gap or cleft, you might hear, hear that word. So that's what plasticity is, the ability of the neurons to now move and communicate easier. And the more often you use those neurons, the more they communicate. Um, as a matter of fact, I am taking a sort of like social media detox. I'm sure you guys have heard that term. Um, and one of the reasons is because compared to when I was younger, I feel like I can't concentrate very well, which I think is a huge issue with you students. Um, like when I was in college, I had no problem. Like I could sit there for hours and read a book. Um, and I could read a hard book even for fun, like not just the textbook. And af I think it's because of all of this time on social media, the way like the internet makes your brain sort of flit from one thing to another. Um, the focus neurons, the ones that help you to deeply focus and deeply think things through, they're not being used. So they're separating. And the like sort of ADHD type of neurons are connecting so that now I sit down and um, like try to read a book and my brain's thinking like, go check your email or go do something else. And it doesn't want to sit down and focus. So I'm like, I'm done with that. Like for me, I remember that ability to concentrate and to sit down and enjoy a book. So you may want to think about that for yourself. Like how well is your, like you might want to take advantage of that plasticity, like rewire your brain so that you can focus easier. Um, I'm actually going to put a video about that in the discussion board. So if I'm confusing you, then you'll get it. All right. Um, what else do we talk about? We can read about that stuff. So you have two nervous systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral, ner peripheral nervous system. Hopefully you can say that better than me. Um, so the central nervous system is basically like the brain and the spinal cord. So those are the neurons. The peripheral nervous system is connecting that nerve, the central nervous system to the rest of the body. So again, that's why you have neurons versus nerves. I kind of mentioned that before. Uh, the peripheral nervous system is the one that gathers sensory information, so feeling and hearing and so on. Um, you have the sensory or afferent ner uh, nervous system, and then you have the efferent or motor, so sensor sensing versus moving. And then the peripheral nervous system um, can be divided down into like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is like the fight or flight. It arouses you. The parasympathetic calms you down. And when I say arousal, that means like excitement of the body, like the processes are all being energized. Um, and then you have the endocrine system. So this is all your hormones. Um, hormones are kind of like neurotransmitters. They carry messages through the body and they activate certain things. So if you see a mountain lion, your brain will tell the endocrine system to release a bunch of hormones that will activate the fight or flight system. So if you don't have 
the right hormones, your body may not be able to respond in the appropriate way. And that's a negative response or a positive response. You may not be able to be happy if you don't have the right hormones. Um, you may not feel like life is good, like life is exciting, all of these positive aspects of life if you don't have enough hormones. It's helpful for us to be able to look at the brain and understand how it's working. So the way we do that, I mean, you can literally cut the skull open and look inside, they have done that. You can put like probes into the brain and zap it with electricity, which is how we map the brain, how we map what we feel, how we map movement. So you can zap a certain part of the brain and the person raises their right arm. Um, EEGs, which are electroencephalograms, are also another way for us to understand how the brain's working. So this is measuring the voltage through the brain, the, the brain waves of electricity. So remember that our body, just like a computer, runs off of electricity, uh, which is why if we get struck by lightning, it's just as bad for us as it is if a computer gets struck by lightning. The EEG helps us to see which parts of the brain are active versus inactive and all in between. Like there's, there's various states of activity which are associated with different behaviors and different mental processes, such as sleeping or dreaming. There's CT scans, there's MRIs, there's PET scans, there's CAT scans. All of these different scans are gonna show us different aspects of the brain. You might be able to um, physically see the brain, like a CT uses x-rays. Um, an MRI uses like the big magnetic machine, which is nice for taking naps in, unless you're claustrophobic. Um, and that gives like a really detailed picture of how the brain's working. The most interesting one is a fMRI or a functional MRI, which shows the activity of the brain in certain areas. So you can see if somebody's happy, what areas of the brain lights up, or if somebody's depressed, what areas of the brain lights up or doesn't light up, in, as the case may be. Each method has its, its um, strengths and weaknesses, but the fMRI is right now is probably the most popular one. Um, to use during research. Okay, so how does the brain work? Let me pull up a picture. In this picture, you're seeing these three levels of the brain. Um, it isn't the best um, way to understand the brain, but it's used all, like all the beginning books have this as, as part of the way to understand it. So there's the reptilian brain, there's the limbic system, and then there's the neocortex. Uh, <coughs> the reptilian com complex, reptilian brain, it's really sort of like the brain stem, it's an extension of the spinal cord, and its job is to regulate like instinctual, in instinctual things, um, like it's your life support system. As a matter of fact, there was a, a chicken that was butchered back in like the early 1900s and it had its head cut off, but the way it was cut, it left the brain stem intact. So the chicken still, it could breathe and its heart kept beating. Um, it could swallow and eat, like all of these very basic instinctual things. Um, and it lived for like a year after that. And the only reason it died was like it choked on a piece of corn or something like that. Not a lot of its behavior changed because chickens are pretty stupid. They do not have a lot of that limbic or neocortex going on. So if that was chopped off, didn't make much of a difference. The limbic system controls emotions. So anger and happiness and all of that. A, a lot of the function happens in that area. The neocortex is the thinking area of the brain, which is why chickens do not have a lot of that area because they are dumb or vice versa. They're dumb because they don't have a lot of that area. So um, evolutionary theory says that the reason that it's shaped like this is because we started out as more reptilian, then we developed emotions, then we developed the ability to think. That's, that's not really well accepted, even though it's in all the textbooks. Um, that used to be like an accepted idea, but it's not anymore. It, there's a lot of interaction between these three layers. Um, so that, that the layer system is very simplistic. Another theory is that um, it may have developed like this because it's more, it, um, you're more likely to stay alive if that reptilian part is the deepest part. Uh, like the chicken, you may cut off some of the cortex 
but if you don't get down to that brainstem, it won't kill you. You can still live. The brainstem, the reptilian portion of the brain, its job is basically like it's a conduit for nerves to pass through to get to the other part of the brain. It has things like the medulla helps regulate body functions. Um, the pons helps with dreaming. The thalamus does a lot of like your sensory motor stuff. You know, so it's very like functional stuff. The limbic system is emotional. This, it's also memory, so it holds your memories. Um, what else does it do? The hippocampus, by the way, is the memory part, also the spatial part. Um, and if it's damaged, then you could lose your memory. So you may have seen the Drew Barrymore movie, Fifty First Dates, I think it's called. If you haven't seen that, watch it, because it's really cute. And it will also help you to understand what could happen if you damage your hippocampus. The amygdala is in the limbic system. Amygdala is awesome. It helps us, it's sort of like the danger filter of the mind. So uh, the amygdala stores emotional memories. And then when any new experiences happens, it goes through the amygdala and the amygdala determines is this dangerous like how should we react to this? And if it's dangerous, then the amygdala will literally, well, not literally, but figuratively, hijack the brain and take over the body. So it does not allow the brain to think things through for a response, it creates an automatic response. So in therapy, you may have like a, a war veteran, like a Marine or somebody who comes in and says, it's driving me crazy, I can't go into a large crowd because I have a panic attack. Well, that's not surprise physiologically as well as psychologically. It's not surprising. Psychology and physiology, the body and the mind are the same thing. Like the mind is your body, and um, the so the amygdala was trained in a crowd. Like if you're in Afghanistan and you're standing in a crowd, it's very dangerous. There could be somebody with a bomb, with a gun. Something bad could happen. So crowds are dangerous. You need to be on high alert if you are in a crowd and if possible, get out of that crowd and get to safety. And now the amygdala goes, oh, we're in another crowd. It might be at the mall or it might be at State of Rotors this time, but that's dangerous. Uh, crowds are dangerous. You need to get out. This is an anxiety situation. You need to be on high alert. And now you have a panic attack and you think, what's wrong with me that I can't handle going to the mall of Victor Valley and, and seeing having having a crowd of people around me that there's that's your amygdala like that's that's normal physiological response now the good thing is you can retrain your amygdala so if you stay because what most people do is they run away from an anxiety provoking situation if you stay in that crowd long enough your amygdala rewires because that plasticity it rewires and it says oh you know crowds actually like this isn't dangerous we haven't had a problem crowds aren't that bad and after a little bit of time, and it doesn't take that long, the amygdala stops responding in a negative way to that situation. Uh, let's see what else is going on in the limbic system. The reward centers in the limbic system. So if you find something funny, if you take drugs, um, those good feelings happen in the limbic system. Uh, <laughs> temperature, that's the hypothalamus, which is also in that layer. Things like that, that's that's what's going on there. So that's an interesting layer. More interesting than the brainstem, less necessary than the brain system, but more interesting. The cerebral cortex, or neocortex, the same thing, that is the thinking part of the brain, the logic part of the brain, personality part of the brain. So this is what makes us human. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, some animals have much more cortex than we humans do. However, in ratio to the rest of the brain, humans have the most cortex. So we may not have, like for instance, a whale has a brain the size of a Volkswagen bug. A blue whale has a, a brain that size. But in ratio to the rest of the brain, it has a much smaller cortex than us humans have, which is why we're smarter. We may not use that smartness for good things necessarily, but we are smarter. Um, so let's see what else. So the brain is separated into two hemispheres or two sides. Like you literally actually have two separate brains and then there's a bridge in between called the corpus callosum. 
So this is just like a bridge of neuron fibers. That's my peacock right there. Hello, peacock. Isn't it pretty? This is an actual brain. So you see that there are two, sorry, another text. You, you can see that there are two literal sides to the brain. Like there's a division down the, the middle, but there is a bridge of nerve fibers that is connecting it. So if you did not have the corpus callosum, and some people actually don't um, because they had it cut during surgery, that helps with epilepsy, uh, then the two hemispheres don't communicate. You don't feel like you have two separate sides of the brain because of that corpus callosum. Um, so one thing that we have found is that the cerebral cortex, different sides control different things. So you may have heard the saying like, somebody's a left brain thinker versus a right brain thinker. Um, because one side of the brain controls more logical thought, one's a bit more emotional, one is like math, the other's music. Well, actually math and music, I think, is on the same side. Um, so, yeah, so different functions, like your ability to um, read versus to describe a picture, that's two separate parts of the brain. And there's really interesting research studies that have been done on people who've had that corpus callosum cut. So one study, they, they put like this divider down the, the middle of the person's head so that their eye was, one eye was seeing something, another eye was seeing something else. And they asked the person to, to write with both hands. And in one picture, or one side, they, there was like a picture of a cupcake and the other side there was the word cupcake. Um, I'm trying to remember how this study goes. I think I'm screwing it up. But basically they could get the hands doing different things, like one drawing, one writing, all at the same time without the person really realizing what they were doing because the different sides of the brain controlled different behaviors. So, and because the corpus callosum was cut, they weren't communicating those behaviors to each other. So yeah, very interesting. Um, now there are also lobes of the cortex. So you have the two hemispheres, the two sides, but there are also lobes. So let me find a picture of that. Brain lobes. So there's... Okay, so there are four different lobes of the brain, frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital. And, and these things, these parts of the brain all have different, isn't this working? All have different functions. That's so weird. Okay. Um, anyhow, so the frontal lobe, um, some of the things it does is it it really has the most advanced mental function. So this is like the executive function of the brain, this personality, creativity, problem solving, emotional and behavioral control. So this is why I said that those three layers of the brain uh, concept are very simplistic because while emotions may be being produced in the limbic system, they're controlled by the cortex. So um, yeah, it's a very simplistic idea. So that's why when um, Phineas Gage had the metal shoot through his brain, it was it only went through his frontal cortex, but it changed his emotional life because he 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 had the inability to control his emotions now. So when the limbic system produced anger, he couldn't control his anger and he became like a really nasty person. You also have mirror neurons in the frontal lobes, which well, I'm going to talk more about in another chapter. They fire, they go off when we see somebody doing something else. So we mirror neurons make us feel like we are doing what the other person is doing. So um, I saw a video on Facebook earlier where a drummer was playing and they accidentally, when they went back to hit again, the drumstick flew out of their hand and hit the person next to them in the face like really hard 
um, and you're like, oh, like I can feel that, that's your mirror neuron firing so that you can, basically you can empathize with another person. Uh, and one of the leading theories about autism is that their mirror neurons are not firing, so they're not feeling connected to the people around them. They, they can't empathize and they just feel really disconnected. Uh, the left frontal lobe specifically is speech, especially a person, uh, um, uh, area known as Broca's area. Um, if that's damaged, then the, somebody can't talk at all. The parietal lobes are on the sides and they specialize in sensation. So when those are hit, um, you may not be able to like keep track of a certain body part. You may go numb. Uh, hearing like your auditory cortex is in the temporal lobe. So if you're hit on these, this side of your head, you may lose your eyesight. I mean, sorry, your ability to hear. You may lose your eyesight if you hit the back of your head because the occipital lobe actually um, <coughs> contains the visual cortex and it gets messages from the eyes. Because remember, your brain doesn't see. So it gets messages from the eye and then it creates these visual images for you to be able to see. Also, when you are thinking about something like, um, Think about your favorite dog, like if you had a pet dog or if you wanted a pet dog. Envision that in your head, see that dog. Um, that is your occipital lobe is now firing in your visual cortex as if you are actually seeing something. So when you th think of a picture in your head, it's really no different than actually seeing something in real life, except you're not getting the messages from the eyes. There's different parts for controlling color. There's different types, uh, different parts of the occipital lobe for um, seeing in black and white. There's different parts of the brain that control shape, um, you know, movement, things like that. So the brain, like it, it has certain regions that specialize in certain, certain things. But again, the entire brain is constantly communicating with each other. Um, there is a term called cerebral dominance. So there's a tendency for each hemisphere, hem hemisphere to take the lead in different tasks. So um, that's why we will say like, oh, it's a right brain thing versus a left brain thing. Um, <laughs> left hemisphere usually um, controls language function. Right hemisphere interprets the emotional tone of somebody's language help you figure out, you know, if they're being sarcastic or not. So some people have more of a dominant brain hemisphere. So, um, well, I mean, I've kind of talked about this. Like if you're a left brain person, we'll usually say like you're more um, logical, less emotional, right brain, or, and oftentimes less creative. Um, whereas right brain people are more emotional let me see, I just can't remember which side music is on. Another interesting thing is that the eyes, the, op the optic nerve actually crisscrosses. So when you see something with your right eye, your left side, your left occipital lobe is processing it and uh, vice versa. Yeah, so analytical and methodical is left brain, creative and artistic is right brained. Um, but that is really simplistic. Let's see. Left is objective, linear. Um, usually they say like the left brain, you're more cool headed. You're more likely to think things through. Right brain people are more likely to like, just sort of go for it. Uh, right brainers are more likely to like, have faith in something without needing the logic. Um, left brain people are more likely to need direction and guidelines to like instructions. Right brain people prefer freedom and autonomy. They don't like rules. They're more likely to consider all possibilities. Left brain people are more likely to look for like the right or the optimal scenario. This is really individual. I don't know if it's genetic. I would imagine there probably is some genetic component to it. Um, let's see which side of which hemisphere controls music? I think up here. Which hemisphere controls music?
Music has been regarded as a right brain activity because of its reliance on creativity, but brain imaging research has shown music does involve both hemisphere, hemispheres, although a majority of the activity does occur in the right side of the brain. Okay, so that just shows you how complex and interactive the hemispheres of the brain are. And it's not as simple as if you do music, which I do music, all right, mm -hmm, that's my flute. Um, when I'm practicing that flute or if you're singing or whatever, then your right hemisphere is more active, but it's also going to be using a lot of the left brain because music involves logic, it involves reading and language, it involves mathematics. So it's not as simplistic as, you know, these beginning textbooks make it out to be. Uh, um, so what else do you need to know in this? I've covered a lot of it. I think we pretty much covered everything in here. Um, obviously there's more in the textbook, so make sure that you read that. Um, things you need to be able to do, like explain uh, what neuroscience is, um, be able to talk about like the evolution, natural se selection, and their relevance to psychological processes, um, describe the fundamental components of genetic processes. So what is DNA? What are genes? What are chromosomes? How does this influence our behavior and experience? Phenotype versus genotype. Um, be able to discuss why psychologists are interested in evolution. Uh, diagram the anatomy of a neuron. That's really important to know um, in psychology. And then if you go on to biology or physiology, like a lot of you are going into nursing. It's super common with my students. You will need to know this. How do neurons communicate? How does the electrical and chemical systems work? Um, how does the endocrine system work in relationship to the nervous system? What do hormones do? How do they influence our behavior and our emotions? Um, how can we study the brain, like the MRI and versus um, PET scan? Um, what's the anatomy of the brain and what, what are the functions of these anatomical structures? Um, what, how do the two hemispheres and the individual lobes of the brain function? So those, that, those are the things that you should know from chapter two. So um, yeah, do your discussion board, all that good stuff. And let me know if you have any questions.